Welcome to the fourth part of the chilling series of serial killers you probably don't know, where we start a journey into the minds of some serial killers from different regions around the world. Get ready as we explore the terrifying stories of these individuals who have caused havoc in various countries. From their twisted motives to their horrifying methods, this video will take you deeper into the dark abyss of human depravity. To follow the three parts, you will find a playlist containing this series. 1. Mokosi Freddy Moladzi Mokosi Freddy Moladzi, also known as the Limpopo serial killer, is a South African robber, rapist and killer responsible for the murders of 13 people between 1990 and 2006. Moladzi was initially imprisoned for two separate murders and an armed robbery in 1990, and broke out of the Baviansport prison in Pretoria in 1996. His murder spree commenced in 2004. During the year he attempted murder three times, broke into houses twice, committed two armed robberies and assaults, all in the Salome and Lavubu areas. His victims included 19-year-old Ndavua Winnedi Thilamandila, who was raped and killed, and her three cousins, Nayad Zina, 14, Shumani, 10, and Lefel Sani Maxwell Sivaguana, 7. All three cousins were hacked to death in their Thohoyan Daom. Another victim was Fofi Tracy Radzalani, 30, killed with a sharp object in her home along with her children, Rotandwa, 7, and Moses Mashiana, 5, who were burned alive in their bedroom. In July 2006 Shanasani Thinandava had her breast, right hand, left ear and upper lip sliced off before being killed. Soon after this murder, Moladzi was captured by police while trying to hide in an unused refrigerator. In late 2006, Moladzi appeared in court, he refused to confess and would cause scenes in the courtroom. In one such incident, Moladzi threatened to sleep during the proceedings if his wife, Takalani Florence Nethingma, charged with possession of stolen goods, and his son were not released. In another he announced that one of the investigators had bribed him with money and phone cards in exchange for a confession. Judge Godfrey Hadassani convicted him of most charges, however, and sentenced him to 11 life terms. 2. John Namgyu John Namgyu was a South Korean serial killer, who from 2004 to 2006 killed 14 people in Jeonggi province and Seoul. On January 14, 2004, he kidnapped, raped and murdered two people. He continued killing others, including a woman walking home late at night. Most of his murders occurred in southern Seoul, including Shingil, Kiro, and Guanik. When John Namgyu killed a male elementary school student after sexually assaulting him, he said it was because he had been abused himself as a child. On April 26, 2006, he was arrested following a fight in which he attempted to kill a man and the man's father. Investigators discovered that he also murdered a woman at Yumundong. Before his confession, serial killer Yu Yunchul confessed, falsely, to the same murder. On April 12, 2007, John Namgyu was sentenced to death by the Supreme Court and detained in Seoul Detention Center. On November 21, 2009, a jail employee discovered that he had attempted to hang himself from a noose made of a plastic bag. He was rushed to the hospital, but died the following morning. 3. Lee Chun Jae Lee Chun Jae, also known as the Korean Zodiac Killer, was convicted of killing 16 people, including his sister-in-law, 10 of which were victims of the Weizong serial murders that occurred between 1986 and 1991. The serial killings are considered to be the most infamous in South Korean history, and even inspired Bong Joon-ho movie Memories of Murder, 2003. The series of rapes and murders began on September 15, 1986 and ended on April 3, 1991. Each woman was found bound, gagged, raped and strangled to death with an item of their own clothing. The Weizong serial murder investigation took more than 2 million men days, with over 21,000 suspects questioned. A sketch of the suspect was drawn from the memory of a bus driver, um, who saw a man board his bus shortly after the seventh murder on September 7, 1988. The description matched the given by survivors of the rapes. The suspect was described as a thin man in his mid-20s, 165 to 170 centimeters tall, with short hair and a sharp nose. In September 1989, 
Li Qingjie broke into a house in Guangzhou, Suan, Jiangi province with weapons and was found by the landlord. He was arrested and sentenced to a year and a half in prison for the charges of robbery and violence. Li filed an appeal, claiming that he was attacked by a young man and only entered the home as he was being chased. The court commuted the sentence to two years probation, and he was released in April 1990. After Li's wife left him, he invited over his 18-year-old sister-in-law, whom he proceeded to drug, rape and murder on January 13, 1994. He offered his father-in-law assistance in finding her, before going to the police to falsely report that she had been abducted. During interrogation, Li asked, How many years do you serve in prison for rape and murder? He denied any responsibility and claimed he was confessing as a result of police coercion. Despite this, he was convicted and sentenced to death. This sentence was commuted to a life sentence with the possibility of parole after 20 years, in 1995. On September 18, 2019, police announced that Lee Chun Jae had been named a suspect in the serial killings. DNA linked him to one of the victim's underwear and subsequent testing confirmed DNA matches with four other crime scenes. At this time, Lee was already serving a life sentence at the Busan prison and initially denied any involvement in the murders. He later confessed to killing 15 people, including all 10 victims of the Weizong serial murders and five others, in addition to more than 30 rapes and attempted rapes. Despite police reaching the conclusion that Lee is guilty of all of these crimes, the statute of limitations for these murders has ended, so he cannot be charged with any of them. 4. M. J. Shankar M. J. Shankar, also known as Psycho Shankar, was an Indian serial killer known for his spate of rapes slash murders between 2008 and 2011. He is believed to have been involved in around 30 rape, murder and robbery cases across Tamil Nadu. Karnataka and Andhra Pradesh. He was accused of killing at least 19 women. After being captured by Indian authorities, Jay Shankar was incarcerated in Bangalore, where he was diagnosed as being mentally ill. He committed suicide after an unsuccessful escape attempt in February 18. Jay Shankar's crimes are known to have begun around 2008. The first crime of his to be reported occurred on July 3, 2009 when he attempted to rape and murder P. Shyamala, 45. By August of that year, he had raped and murdered 12 women, and raped a further 6 women. Jay Shankar kept a machete in his bag, killing whoever resisted him. He would kidnap sex workers near Dabas, roadside cafes, on highways, raping and killing them brutally. He also targeted women living in farmhouses or other, similar, rural areas. On August 23, 2009, Jay Shankar raped and murdered 39-year-old police constable M. Jayamani. Usually stationed at the all-women police station in Kungiyam, Jayamani was on temporary assignment at Paramanalar for the visit of Deputy Chief Minister M. K. Stalin. Jay Shankar kidnapped her, raped her multiple times, and killed her. The police found her body one month later. Jay Shankar and his accomplice P. Mohan Selvam were charged with the murder of 50-year-old K. Thangamal Panya on September 10, 2009. The pair were acquitted in this case in 2014 due to insufficient evidence. The Tirupur police began a manhunt for Jay Shankar and arrested him on October 19, 2009. He was locked up at the Coimbatore Central Prison and was charged with 13 counts of rape and murder in Tirupur, Salem and Dharmapuri. Whilst in custody he confessed that he enjoyed torturing women before raping and killing them. On March 17, 2011, police took Jay Shankar to a fast-track court in Nirmapuri for a murder trial. The following day, armed reserve police constables M. Chinasmai and Rajavelu were assigned to escort him back to Coimbatore. On this journey, Jay Shankar managed to escape at the Salem bus stand at around 9.30 p.m. Two days later, Chinasmai shot himself due to shame. Jay Shankar escaped to Karnataka, where he raped and murdered six women in a month in Bellari. He also killed a man and a child in Nirmapuri. At the end of April 2011 the police managed to trace his phone to Delhi. They initially believed that he had dumped his phone there, but in May, they traced his calls to Mumbai, where he stopped using it. A special team, made up of two sub-inspectors and 15 other officers, 
was assigned to find and arrest Jay Shankar. By May of 2011 the police had distributed wanted posters in public places across Karnataka and Tamil Nadu, looking for information about Jay Shankar's whereabouts. On the evening of May 4, 2011, he reached Elijai village in Karnataka on a stolen motorcycle. He approached Chandrakala Otaki, working alone in a field, asking her for water and food. He proceeded to try and rape her, but she raised the alarm and her husband came to her rescue, along with a friend. Jay Shankar tried to run away but Prakash Otaki and other villages caught him and took him to the Zalaki police station. He was handed over to the Chitradurga police on May 5, 2011. Following his arrest he was kept at the Parapana Agrahara Central Jail in Bangalore, he was sentenced to 27 years in prison. Whilst at the jail he received treatment for psychiatric problems. On August 31, 2013, police took Jay Shankar to the courthouse in Tumkar near Bangalore. After returning that evening, Jay Shankar faked illness and was admitted to the prison hospital wing. There, he managed to get hold of a duplicate key and used it at 2 a.m. on September 1, 2013, when the daily guard change occurred. Police suspected that an insider helped him get the key. Jay Shankar scaled a 20-foot wall, then walked across a 15-foot wall before finally climbing the 30-foot high compound wall. He then managed to safely cross the electric fence, since, luckily for him, it was not functional that night. It was reported that he carried a bamboo pole with him to balance on the walls and a bed sheet to use for cushioning the glass pieces on top of the wall. Jay Shankar was injured during the escape and drops of his blood were discovered outside the outer wall. It was also reported that he was wearing a prison uniform during the escape. Eleven jail staff, including three wardens, two jailers and six security guards, were suspended as a result of the escape. Police issued a red alert to all Karnataka police stations, also urging women to be careful in isolated areas. A reward of 500,000 Indian rupees was announced for any information leading to Jay Shankar's arrest. Police also analyzed his behavior, psychology and history in an attempt to predict his next actions. 10,000 wanted posters and 75,000 pamphlets with photographs of Jay Shankar and in five languages, Hindi, Kannada, Marathi, Tamil, and Telugu, were printed. These were distributed in Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, Andhra Pradesh, Kerala and Maharashtra. During his second escape Jay Shankar had fractured his leg jumping from the 30-foot high wall of the prison compound. He didn't contact his family in Tamil Nadu, but soon after his escape a police informant managed to get in touch with him. This informant lured Jay Shankar to a dilapidated building near the Kudlu Gate in Bangalore, promising him a motorcycle in order to escape the city. Instead, police arrested him at noon on September 6, 2013. It cost the government over 75,000 Indian rupees to treat his fractured leg at the Victoria Hospital, in an operation on September 23. After the surgery Jay Shankar was sent to Central Prison in Bangalore with 24-7 CCTV monitoring his cell along with extra lights. The lock on his cell door was designed to be unreachable by the person within. It was also decided that in case of illness, Jay Shankar would be treated in his cell, rather than being taken to the hospital wing. Police also agreed to deploy extra security while escorting him to trials in order to minimize the chance of escape. On February 25, 2018, Jay Shankar unsuccessfully attempted a third prison escape and was subsequently held in solitary confinement. Two days later he committed suicide by slitting his throat with a shaving blade that he had acquired from a barber the day before. Jail staff discovered him lying in a pool of blood at 2.30 a.m. during their daily rounds and gave first aid. He was later moved to Victoria Hospital and it is there that he was declared dead at 5.10 a.m. 5. Ramadan Abdul Rehim Mansour Ramadan Abdul Rehim Mansour, also known as Al Turbini, was a street gang leader and serial killer who raped and killed at least 32 children in a seven-year period in several locations in Egypt. All of Mansour's victims were between 10 to 14 years old, most of them boys. Mansour was arrested in 2006 with six accomplices and was subsequently sentenced to death. He left his home in Tanta, north of Cairo, and joined a street gang at a young age. 
There, gang leaders taught him survival skills, allegedly slicing him with racers when he made mistakes. According to his later confession, Mansour soon learned the way to get back at those who had crossed him, by raping them and murdering anyone who threatened to go to the police afterwards. One victim, 12-year-old Ahmed Naqui, had been a member of Mansour's gang. When Mansour attempted to sexually assault him, Naqui reported him to the police and Mansour was arrested. He was released for lack of evidence. Soon after Mansour raped and murdered Naqui in revenge, according to the prosecutors. Mansour would often travel between Cairo and Alexandria by train. He felt safe in Alexandria because it had fewer police officers. The Vice Department of Borg El Arab Police Station in Alexandria started to keep an eye on him at this time. Mansour and his gang members lured street children onto the carriage roof of the trains where they then raped and tortured them before tossing them onto the trackside, dead or barely alive. Some of the children were dumped in the Nile or buried alive. The crimes of Mansour and his gang came to light in 2006 when two of his gang members were arrested and Mansour acquired the nickname Al Turbini, Express Train, after his favorite location for the crimes. Following his arrest, Mansour reportedly told prosecutors that he was possessed by a female jinn who forced him to commit the crimes. Mansour, along with accomplice Farag Samir Mahmood, also known as Hana, were convicted and sentenced to death by the criminal court in Tanta in 2007. He was executed in 2010. 6. Bruno Ludke Bruno Ludke was an alleged German serial killer who was connected to at least 51 murder victims by Nazi police officials. The victims were mainly women, and were killed in a 15-year period between 1928 and 1943, when he was arrested. He was born in Copenhagen on April 3, 1908 and had a mild intellectual disability. He couldn't tell investigators how many minutes were in an hour, for instance. He worked as a coachman and was well known by the local police as a petty thief and peeping Tom. On January 31, 1943, a woman was found dead in the woods near Kopenick, strangled with her own shawl. The victim showed signs of sexual abuse after her death and her purse had been taken. Police brought in Ludke for questioning on March 18, 1943, where he quickly admitted killing not only the woman in question but several other victims, and was taken into custody. Witnesses reported that Ludke showed signs of being physically abused and he stated, they would kill me if I didn't confess. Ludke never went to trial for any of the killings. He was declared insane and was sent to the SS-run Institute of Criminological Medicine in Vienna, where medical experiments were performed on him until his death when an experiment went wrong in 1944. The 50-plus crime scenes showed no similarities in MO, signature or motive. No fingerprints were ever discovered at the scenes and no evidence against Ludke was ever presented. Jan Blau, a Dutch former chief of police, took an interest in the case and investigated the original reports. He found them inconclusive, incoherent and vague. He didn't believe that a semi-illiterate who was once caught stealing a chicken could manage to get away with murder for over 20 years. Many believe that Ludke was the victim of framing by the Nazi government, who had little patience for people with intellectual disabilities. The true nature of the 51 murders remains unsolved to this day. 7. Yu Young Chul Yu Young Chul, also known as the Raincoat Killer, is a serial killer and cannibal from South Korea. He confessed to the murders of 21 people, mostly prostitutes and rich elderly men, the Seoul Central District Court convicted him of 20 murders as one was dismissed on a technicality. You burned at least three victims and mutilated at least 11, eating the livers of some. His crimes were committed between September 2003 and July 2004, when he was arrested. You explained his motive in front of a TV camera, saying, women shouldn't be sluts, and the rich should know what they've done. You was known to have married in 1992 and had a son. He was convicted 14 times previously on different charges, serving 7 years in total prior to his series of murders. Between September and November 2003, you killed several wealthy elderly people, breaking into their homes and bludgeoning them to death with a hammer. Each time you staged the scene to look like a robbery gone wrong, but no money was taken, which confused investigators. When the investigation intensified, 
you began to target female masseuses instead. He was briefly arrested on a theft charge in January 2004, but released after just two days. From March 2004 you began calling prostitutes to his western soul home, bludgeoning them after sex. These victims were dismembered and mutilated in order to prevent identification, before being buried in the mountains surrounding the city. Police recovered 11 corpses from the mountain behind Bun Wan Temple following Yu's eventual arrest. During interrogation, Yu confessed to the murders of 19 people. On July 18, 2004, he admitted to the murder of a 45-year-old male street vendor. He confessed to the murders of a further 26 people on July 19, 2004, several days after his arrest, but no details were given. The list of alleged victims included several people that didn't match his usual pattern of wealthy seniors or masseuses. Friends of two masseuse victims, whose bodies had been found, claimed they weren't actually involved in massage therapy meaning you could have other, unreported victims. Although the rainy Thursday murderer was killing simultaneously, starting in April 2004, police weren't able to link you to those murders. A few days later you confessed to killing a young woman, who worked in a clothing store, on February 6, 2004, in Heimendon after he suspected her of being a prostitute. You approached her for questioning, pretending he was a police officer. Around a month after his arrest you confessed to have eaten the flesh of his victims, but no evidence of this was discovered. Yu was taken into custody on July 15, 2004 and confessed to killing as many as 19 people initially, mainly rich senior citizens and masseuses. He had raised suspicions by calling a massage parlor where a few employees had recently gone missing after receiving similar phone calls. As a result, the owner of the massage parlor, with several employees and one police officer, went to the prearranged meeting place. The officer left before you arrived and you was captured by the employees of the massage parlor. Another police officer placed handcuffs on you. While in custody he faked epileptic symptoms and escaped from police after his restraints were loosened. He was rearrested 12 hours later. You had attempted to escape one before, after being arrested in 2002 for rape, again by faking an epileptic seizure. The mother of the Imondon murder victim rushed at you with an umbrella when he was brought to the prosecutor's office later in July, screaming that her daughter would still be alive if police had caught him earlier. A policeman kicked the woman in the chest to subdue her, claiming his hands were busy holding you. Based on the items in his apartment, which was searched after his arrest, there were some rumors that his murders were based on movies, including Public Enemy, very bad things, and normal life. You later claimed to have been inspired by serial killer John Duyon, who murdered nine wealthy people in Busan between 1999 and 2000. You stated that his hatred of the rich came from early childhood, when he felt jealous of a large house, his family were extremely poor. Yu's hatred of women came from a lover, a masseuse, who left him after discovering his criminal past. Police admitted they didn't have a lot of physical evidence linking you to the murders. He first appeared in court on September 6, 2004, and refused to defend himself, saying he intended to boycott the rest of the trial, and apologized to the victims. He boasted that he had no intention of stopping. When he was forced to return to court two weeks later he lunged at the three presiding judges and recanted his confession for the February 2004 Imondong murder. He refused to appear at his next court session on October 4, 2004, after attempting to commit suicide the night before. Yu again disrupted a hearing when he tried to attack a spectator who had cursed him, this ended with Yu signing a statement that he would not cause any more commotion. Prosecutors asked for the death penalty, which Yu thanked them for, and he was sentenced to death on December 13, 2004, for 20 counts of murder, the count of murder for the woman in Imondon was thrown out due to his recanted confession and lack of evidence. Prosecutors appealed the verdict to try and obtain the 21st count of murder but the lower court sentence was upheld on June 8, 2005 by the Supreme Court. His case fueled the debate on capital punishment in South Korea. Although the death penalty is still legal it hasn't been carried out since 1997. It seemed that capital punishment might be abolished before Yu's arrest, but support for it has actually grown since his crimes were revealed. The Seoul Central District Court said, 
Murders of as many as 20 people are unprecedented in the nation and a very serious crime. The death penalty is inevitable for you in light of the enormous pains inflicted on the families concerned and the entire society. H. Tillis Carnier. Tillis Carnier, also known as the Hermit of Saint Benoît and the Werewolf of Dole, was a cannibal and serial killer who was convicted of being a werewolf in 16th century France. Carnier was a hermit and reclusive who lived outside the town of Dole in the Franche Comte province in France. He'd recently been married and moved his new wife out to his isolated home. Not being used to feeding anyone but himself, Carnier found it difficult to provide for his new wife, which caused problems between the couple. During this time, several local children went missing or were found dead and the authorities of the region issued an edict encouraging the locals to apprehend and kill the werewolf responsible. One evening a group of workers who were traveling from a nearby town came upon what they thought in the dark was a wolf but was later recognized as the hermit, Gillis Garnier, with the body of a dead child. He was arrested soon after. According to Garnier during his trial, while he was in the forest hunting, trying to find food for himself and his wife, a ghost appeared offering to ease his worries and gave him an ointment that would let him change into the form of a wolf, making it easier to hunt. Garnier confessed to stalking and killing at least four children between the ages of nine and twelve. In October 1572 Garnier killed his first victim, a ten-year-old girl he dragged into a vineyard outside Dole. He strangled the girl, stripped her, and ate the flesh of her arms and thighs. When he had finished, he brutally attacked another young girl, biting and clawing at her, but was interrupted and ran away. The girl died of her injuries a few days later. In November Garnier killed a ten-year-old boy, again eating from his thighs and belly and tearing off a leg to save for later. He strangled another young boy but was interrupted again and forced to abandon his prey before he could eat from him. He also savagely attacked an unknown boy who was passing by and cut the boy almost in half by biting and tearing at his stomach. In 1573, he strangled a girl, ate her flesh, tore away her left leg and took it back for his wife. Gillis Garnier was found guilty of crimes of lycanthropy and witchcraft and was burned at the stake on January 18, 1573. Although he was burned at the stake, Garnier's trial was conducted by the secular authorities and not the Inquisition, as superstition was not judged by them. Over 50 witnesses testified that he had attacked and killed children in the local fields and vineyards, eating their flesh raw. He was sometimes seen in human shape, sometimes as a Lugaru, werewolf. 9. Marcel Pettiot Marcel Pettiot, also known as Captain Valerie and Dr. Satan, was a French doctor and serial killer who was convicted of multiple murders after the remains of 23 people were found in the basement of his home during World War II. He is suspected of murdering around 60 victims, but the true number is unknown. Marcel Andre Henri Felix Pettiot was born on January 17, 1897, in Auxerre, France. There were various reports of his delinquent and criminal acts during his youth. A psychiatrist diagnosed Pettiot as mentally ill on March 26, 1914, and he was expelled from school multiple times. He finished his education in a special academy in Paris in July 1915. During the First World War, Pettiot volunteered for the French Army, beginning his service in January 1916. In the Second Battle of the Aisne, Pettiot was wounded and gassed and he began to show symptoms of a mental breakdown. He was sent to several rest homes where he was arrested for stealing blankets, morphine and other army supplies, as well as wallets, photographs and letters. He ended up being jailed in Orleans. In a psychiatric hospital in fleury les aubrais Pettiot was again diagnosed with various mental illnesses but was sent back to the front line in June 1918. Three weeks after allegedly injuring his own foot with a grenade he was transferred but was attached to a new regiment in September. A new diagnosis managed to get him discharged with a disability pension. Following the war, Pettiot began the accelerated education program that was set up for war veterans. He completed medical school in just eight months and became an intern at the mental hospital in Evreux. Pettiot received his medical degree in 1921 and then moved to villeneuve sur yon where he received payment for his medical services from both the government medical assistance funds and from his patients. 
At this time he was already addicted to dangerous narcotics. Whilst in this job Petty had gained a reputation for dubious medical practices, such as supplying narcotics, performing illegal abortions and theft. His first murder victim is believed to have been Louise Delaveau, the daughter of an elderly patient of Petiot's, with whom he was having an affair in 1926. Delaveau disappeared in May of the same year and neighbors later claimed to have seen the doctor load a trunk into his car. The same year Petiot ran for mayor of the town and hired someone to interrupt a political debate with his opponent. He won and whilst in office embezzled town funds. In June 1927 Petiot married Georgette Laplay, 23, the daughter of a rich landowner and butcher in St. Lay. The couple's son, Gerhardt, was born in April the following year. The prefect of Yon Department, state government, received many complaints about Petiot and he was eventually suspended from his position as mayor in August 1931, he later resigned. He still had a lot of supporters and the village council also resigned in sympathy. Five weeks later, on October 18, he was elected as a councillor of Yon Department. In 1932, he was accused of stealing electric power from the village and lost his council seat. By this time he had moved to Paris, where he attracted patients by using fake credentials and managed to build an impressive reputation for his practice, located at 66 Rue de Camarden. There were rumors of illegal abortions and excessive prescriptions of addictive narcotics. In 1936 Petiot was appointed Médecin d'État civil, medical officer, with the authority to write death certificates. The same year he was briefly institutionalized for kleptomania but was released within the year. He continued to evade his taxes. After the German defeat of France in 1940, French citizens were drafted for forced labor in Germany. Petiot would provide fake medical disability certificates to people who were drafted and also treated the illnesses of workers who had returned. In July of 1942, Petiot was convicted of overprescribing narcotics despite the fact that two addicts who would have testified against him had disappeared. He ended up being fined 2,400 francs. Petiot would later claim that during the period of German occupation he was engaged in resistance activities. He is alleged to have developed secret weapons to kill Germans without leaving forensic evidence, planted booby traps across Paris, had high-level meetings with Allied commanders, and worked with a group of Spanish anti-fascists. There was, however, no evidence to support these statements, but in 1980 he was cited by former U.S. spymaster Colonel John F. Cronbach as a World War II source. Cronbach was founder and head of a small independent espionage agency, later known as the Pond, which was operational between 1942 and 1955. Cronbach stated that Petiot had reported the Catton Forest Massacre, German missile development at Piedmont and the names of Abwehr agents sent to America. Whilst these claims weren't supported by any records of other intelligence services, in 2001 some pond records were discovered, including a cable that mentioned Petiot. Petiot's biggest money earner during the occupation was his false escape route. Using the codename Dr. Eugene, Petiot pretended he had a way to get people who were wanted by the Germans or the Vichy government to safety outside France. He claimed to be able to arrange passage to Argentina or elsewhere in South America via Portugal for just 25,000 francs per person. Three accomplices, Raoul Fourier, Edmund Pintet, and René Gustav Nesendet, directed victims to Dr. Eugene, including Jews, resistance fighters, and criminals, and once in his control, Petiot would tell them that Argentine officials required anyone entering the country to be inoculated against disease, using this excuse to inject them with cyanide. He then stole their possessions and disposed of the bodies. At first Petiot threw the bodies in the Seine, but later destroyed the bodies by submerging them in quicklime or incinerating them. In 1941, Petiot bought a house at 21 Rue Le Sur, buying it the same week that Henri Lafont, head of the French Gestapo, returned to Paris with money and permission from the Abwehr to recruit new people for the French Gestapo. Petty had failed to keep his head down, and the Gestapo eventually found out about him. By April 1943 they had heard all about his escape route which they assumed was part of the resistance. Robert Jacquem, a Gestapo agent, forced prisoner Yvonne Dreyfus to approach the so-called network but Dreyfus disappeared. A later informed managed to infiltrate the operation and the Gestapo arrested Fourier, Pinted, 
and Nezendet. Whilst being tortured, they confessed that Dr. Eugene was Marcel Pettiot. Nezendet was later released, but three others spent eight months in prison on suspicion of helping Jews to escape. Even under torture, they didn't identify any other members of the resistance because they didn't know of any. The Gestapo released the three men in January 1944. On March 11, 1944, Pettiot's neighbors in Rulusur complained to the police about a foul stench in the area and large amounts of smoke billowing from the chimney of a house. Worried about the possibility of a chimney fire, the police called firemen, who entered the house and discovered a roaring fire in a coal stove in the basement. In the fire, and scattered throughout the basement, were human remains. David King, in his book Death in the City of Light, the serial killer of Nazi-occupied Paris, writes, the extensive coverage of the Petit Affair soon escalated into a full-blown media circus. Newspapers dubbed the doctor the Butcher of Paris, Scalper of the Atoile, the Monster of Rue Sur, the Demonic Ogre, and Dr. Satan. One of the first and more popular sober case was the modern Bluebeard. Later, other names would be proposed for the murder suspect, from the underground assassin to the werewolf of Paris. The massive media coverage went international, the same source reporting, in Switzerland, Belgium, and Scandinavia, the Pettiot Affair dominated headlines on a daily basis. For the next seven months Pettiot hid with friends, telling them the Gestapo wanted him because he had killed Germans and informers. He eventually lived with a patient, Georges Redoute, let his beard grow out and adopted different aliases. During the liberation of Paris in 1944 Pettiot took the name Henri Valéry and joined the French forces of the interior in the uprising. He became a captain in charge of counter-espionage and prisoner interrogations. When the newspaper Resistance published an article about Pettiot his defense attorney from the 1942 narcotics case got a letter in which his fugitive client claimed that the published allegations were all lies. This gave police the idea that Pettiot was still in Paris. The search restarted, with Henri Valéry among those who were drafted to locate him. Finally, on October 31st, Pettiot was spotted at a Paris metro station and arrested. In his possession were a pistol, 31,700 francs, and 50 sets of identity documents. Marcel Pettiot was imprisoned in La Sante prison. He proclaimed his innocence and stated he had only killed enemies of France. He said he had discovered the pile of bodies in 21 Rue Sur in February 1944, but had assumed that they were collaborators who had been killed by members of his resistance network. Police found out that Petty had had no friends in any of the major resistance groups, in fact some of the resistance groups he mentioned had never even existed, and there was no proof of any of his claimed exploits. Prosecutors eventually charged him with at least 27 murders for profit. Their estimate of his gains ran to 200 million francs. He went on trial on March 19, 1946, facing 135 criminal charges. René Floriot acted as his defense against a team of state prosecutors and 12 civil lawyers hired by relatives of Pettiot's victims. Pettiot taunted prosecutors claiming that various victims had been collaborators or double agents and that vanished people were in fact alive and well in South America under new names. He admitted to killing just 19 of the 27 victims found in his house and claimed that they were Germans and collaborators, part of a total of 63 enemies killed. Floria tried to portray Pettiot as a resistance hero, but the judges and jurors weren't impressed. Pettiot was convicted of 26 counts of murder and sentenced to death. He was beheaded on May 25, 1946, after a stay of a few days due to a problem in the release mechanism of the guillotine. 10. Vasily Komarov Vasily Ivanovich Komarov, also known as the Wolf of Moscow and the Shabalaka Street Killer, was a Russian serial killer who was convicted of killing 29 people in a two-year period between 1921 and 1923. Komarov was one of the earliest known serial killers in the Soviet Union and was a horse trader who murdered at least 33 customers in the stable next to his home. He was executed on June 18, 1923. Komarov was born Vasily Terentovich Petrov in 1871. His family, who lived in Vitebsk Governorate, Russian Empire, were very poor, many of them suffering from alcoholism, he himself began drinking at around age 15. 
Komarov was conscripted into the Russian army for four years and got married at the age of 28. In 1904, during the Russian-Japanese War, he traveled to the Far East and managed to earn a small fortune, which he soon wasted. Komarov was given a one-year prison sentence for robbing a military warehouse and while he was serving this sentence his wife died of cholera. After being released Komarov settled in Riga, now part of Latvia, where he married Polish widow Sofia, having two children. Komarov, still drinking heavily, often beat his family. In 1915, during World War I when troops from the German Empire entered the Baltic, Komarov and his family moved to the Volga region of Russia. After the Russian Empire started to collapse in 1917, Komarov joined the Red Army during October Revolution, learning to read and write and achieving the position of platoon commander. Whilst fighting during the Russian Civil War, he was captured by the White Army troops of General Denikin, he managed to escape but in order to avoid being judged by the Military Revolutionary Tribunal he changed his name to Vasily Ivanovich Komarov, sometimes spelled Komarov, and in 1920 moved to Moscow with his family. Komarov settled at 26 Shabalovka Street where he began working as a carriage driver slash horse trader, as well as continuing to be a thief. In February 1921 when Vladimir Lenin declared the country's new economic policy, which allowed private enterprise, Komarov began committing murders. All of his killings followed a similar pattern, he could become acquainted with a client who wanted to buy a horse, and would bring them to his home and serve them vodka. The victims would be killed with a hammer or their throats would be slit. The corpse was then placed in a bag and either hidden around the house, buried underground or dumped in the Moscow River. In 1922 Komarov's wife Sofia found out about the murders, but was quite calm about it, and began helping her husband in the killings. In 1921 he committed at least 17 murders and 12 in the next two years, despite later confessing to 33 murders. Police began noticing a series of murders occurring around Moscow when the bodies of men, totaling 21, were being found in garbage sacks every Thursday or Saturday, which led to a two-year investigation. Komarov was known as a happily married man, but people close to the family knew that he was an abusive alcohol who had once tried to kill his eight-year-old son. Spectators in the market where he went to sell his horses began noticing that he came every Wednesday and Friday, the days before bodies were being found, many times without a horse, but almost always leaving with a customer. In early 1923 police turned up at Komarov's home on the premise of investigating his illegal alcohol, but during a search of the stable they found his last victim under a haystack. Komarov evaded police by jumping out of a window, but on March 18th was arrested in Moscow Oblast. While being interrogated by police, Komarov admitted to killing 33 men, as far as he could remember, who had come to him looking to buy horses. The motive for the murders was considered to be robbery, but he didn't actually gain a large amount from his victims. After confessing to the murders, Komarov led police to his disposal sites but only six of the remaining 12 were found. When interviewed about his crimes, he referred to the murders as an awfully easy job. Whilst in prison, Komarov attempted suicide three times. Sofia was also found guilty of murder, since police believed it would be impossible for her not to have known what her husband was doing in the stable next to their home. Komarov and Sofia were sentenced to death and were both executed by firing squad in Moscow on June 18, 1923. As we conclude this harrowing exploration, we are left with a grim reminder of the sinister capabilities that lurk within some individuals. These ten notorious serial killers from different corners of the world have left a trail of terror and tragedy in their wake. By shining a light on their crimes, we hope to gain a better understanding of the complex and disturbing nature of these individuals. Remember, the study of such cases not only serves as a chilling reminder of our own vulnerability but also helps us work towards preventing such atrocities in the future. Stay vigilant, and may the echoes of these haunting tales never fade from our collective consciousness.